Well, welcome everybody to another Hall of Fame inductee, and we are here today with Jenny and Jason Weld, and we're going to be talking a little bit about Ricky Weld and his career in racing here in the Kansas City area. Of course, I believe if we all thought about it, probably there is not a name that is more recognizable in Kansas City as well as some national scenes as well. So. We're, I think, all pretty familiar with that and realize what Ricky probably grew up in. And I'm sure it was a lot of pressure on him, but Ricky was born Charles Richard McMillan in 1955, but that was only for nine years. And then Pappy Weld and Eleonora Weld adopted Ricky, and I presume just started calling him Ricky. Is that right, Jenny? That is correct, yes. They called him Ricky. And then that was it. I mean, was there a reason? Was that from the middle name Richard? Or? Uh, yes, that was from the middle name Richard. He got, he just was always called Ricky Well, so yeah. that's how people remembered him. That was it, and the Charles was done. It was all over. That was all over. <laughs> people didn't know, if they would have said Charles, well, they wouldn't have known who it was. Right. <laughs> okay, at, I believe it was 12 years old, uh, Ricky more or less starts his racing career, but it's in the garage <laughs> of his dad's shop sweeping the floors. So it just shows that Ricky wasn't really given any um, special consideration. And he started at the bottom just like everybody. He did, he started at the bottom. And sometimes he would get in all their way too while they were working on their race cars and they'd shoo him off, you know, because he wanted to get right in there with them. He just, just didn't know what he was doing yet, you know, except for sweeping the floors. But he was really mechanically inclined and yeah. he had that mindset. Yeah. Okay, in 1970, his brother, Jerry, built his first race car and, and it was a mini stock and Jerry, or Ricky would be racing this at Olympic Stadium. Uh, you want to answer this one, Jason? How, how did he do in that first season? Well, he won Rookie of the Year, and uh, I know that he was ornery, and he, he couldn't hardly see over the steering wheel when he was in that car, and, but he was determined to run it anyway. Uh -huh. He did it without the uh, permission of his brother. Um, <laughs> but um, he got he got scolded for that one afterwards, but uh, you know, he wasn't to be stopped. Yeah. He was, he was determined to do it. <laughs> he had that determination. I, I guess that's one of the things that you have to think about racers is, man, they, they've got that drive. And, boy, once they get it, there is no stopping it. That's I mean, true. Uh, just like an interview I did the other day, a gentleman, 63 years old, and I swear he's got that fire burning just like if he was probably 16 or 18 years old. He still wants to get out there and do it. In 71, and it doesn't take Ricky, I guess, long to move up because this is only one year, but he steps into the super modified, the number 90, which is, of course, representative of the Well family. I think they had numbers all through the 90s, if I remember right, and uh, decides to start racing that super modified. And I mean, he jumps right in with the big guys, Jenny. He did, he jumped right in there, and he he did really well. I think he surprised his family at how well he could do. So uh, he, he, was, he was just going for it, yeah. he did. Okay, that, then he's just 16 years old, and he's racing in probably what was the premier class, because actually back in these times, the sprint cars, the super modifieds, I mean, they were the deal. That's that's what you eventually worked up to and moved into. But the Olympic Stadium there again, boy, what a little bull ring that thing was. Oh, he loved that track. He loved it because his brothers raced on it, and, and he was able to race on it, and his hero, A.J. Foyt, raced on it. Yeah. So he really enjoyed that. And and how did he come out in that, that first season? In oh, that? he won Rookie of the Year again in 1971 at two two tracks, Riverside and Olympic. So uh -huh. he really was showing all the tracks in the Midwest area yeah. what he had, just like his brothers did. So <laughs> he's just trying to keep up with them. <laughs> you, know, you know, sometimes at that age, uh, guys don't know what exactly they're into or what they're facing. And I guess there's no fear or of, of losing or whatever, so they just go at it wholehearted. And it sounds like that's what Ricky did, because in his lifetime he had 41 feature wins, and out of that 41, 29 of them were won in those first two years. So he was really going after them at that time. He was going after it, and he wanted to show everybody he could do it too, yeah. and he did. Uh, 
this might be a good time to kind of talk a little bit about Ricky being a member of the Well family. I know you and I discussed it somewhat on the phone the other day, but it sounded like, um, I wouldn't say this was something that hung over Ricky's head, because I think he kind of raced through it or whatever, but he still felt that pressure, didn't he? He did feel the pressure. He always said he felt like he had to fill some shoes, and uh, he had some mighty shoes to fill, and he did, he did his best at what he had. Yeah. And I'm, I think they were all were very proud of him, and, but he seemed to always have that little yeah. worry that back there if he was ever going to win like his brothers. Yeah. It, it wasn't like, and I, I'm like you, I think a lot of people had these thoughts, well, he's a weld. He's running all the best and top equipment, but he wasn't. He was more or less, as you told me, he went through the shop, out behind the shop, picked up stuff, and we put it together, and that's what he raised. Well, you know, Rick used parts that Pappy had. They call them antique parts. <laughs> A big pile of them is what I hear. And uh, he'd go through those, and I think that's how Ricky learned to fix things with what he had, uh -huh. because that's what he did here at home, too. Uh -huh. uh, and he'd work on people's cars, you know, and yeah. fix them. Make them go. <laughs> Make them go. Now, are we, you're talking about race cars? Yes. Okay. I was going to say, I didn't think you meant he was just doing mechanics work. No. He was working on race cars. Okay. Um, of the 41 features that Ricky won and raced at different tracks here around the area, um, I believe you told me they're Knoxville. Do you know, did, did Ricky race up there uh, pretty much on a, the weekly basis? Yes, he did race at the weekly basis up there a lot with the Jordan brothers, and uh, uh, he liked to race for them, and he raced for his dad there, and mm -hmm. he did some, I think he tried out for a national in 1974. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that brings up another topic that we okay. need to cover, too, and that is driving for his dad, because <laughs> I've talked to several other drivers that drove for Pappy, and... Uh, my understanding was uh, you either won or succeeded and won some money or you didn't drive the next race. That's true. <laughs> if you didn't win or you broke something, you were fired for the night and someone else was in it the next night. <laughs> and Pappy just was, he was hard with that. He yeah. wanted to win all the time and he, he knew he had the best equipment out there. Yes. <laughs> so he expected his boys to do it. <laughs> he fired every one of them once yeah. at least or more. <laughs> Several of the tracks, going back to that, where Ricky did drive, it was Knoxville, Eldora, Eagle, uh, the Iowa State Fairgrounds there in Des Moines, Sedalia, and I'm sure several others that he raced at, yeah. particularly around this area. Yeah, he raced at Marshall, Lakeside, Riverside. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, Jason, maybe you can tell me this. Who were some of the car owners that uh, your dad drove for? Well, he drove for his dad to start out with, and, and um, he drove for the Jordan brothers. Mm -hmm. He also drove for uh, a guy named Vanderwood, mm -hmm. and uh, did well there. Mm -hmm. Won a disputed championship in '85 with them. Uh -huh. um, he was also a car owner mm -hmm. as well. Uh, had, a, had a driver named Mark Zaranatello that drove for him. Okay. So not only did he drive for many people, he also owned, owned cars himself. Okay. I, I just happened to see the picture up there a while ago. Uh, did he drive the Beaver Special? He did drive the Beaver Special. Um, of course, that's a Kansas City-based tool company, and uh, well, Sammy Swindell, I think, drove that at one time. He did drive for them. He, he didn't drive. I'm not sure how long he drove for them. Mm -hmm. um, that's information we don't really have. Can't get your hands on right now. How many races he ran. We know that he yeah. did drive the car. Uh -huh. um, we don't know how long. Okay. And... Uh, also, our friend John Cunningham told us he drove the 4X car. Oh, a trossel. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes, so I think he drove that one time for okay. John. All right. And then you know where? Knoxville? Yes, up at Knoxville. Okay. Yes, that's where it was. 74 through 85, uh, Ricky was driving uh, one of the tank cars at Knoxville, and we believe he won a feature there, if, you, if I'm correct me if I'm wrong on this, in the little Duffy car for the Jordan brother. Yes, he did. He raced, he, he got there one time in victory lane and he was really, 
it's hard to get in victory lane at Knoxville. And when, uh, you, when you succeed and get one win, that's special to you. Yeah. And it was very special to Rick to know that he, he at least won one race there. Yeah. Yeah. So. Would either one of you like to expand a little bit on what a tank car was? <laughs> <laughs> what a tank car was? Yeah. Ba basically, it was Pappy Weld with four wheels on it. <laughs> I mean, if you, knew, if you knew Pappy Weld, then you knew that that car was, you know, it, it was wrenched by one of the best mechanics that yeah. you could possibly have. Yeah. And, of course, wrenched by Jerry and Greg as well. Uh -huh. And, you know, that car was, you know, Pappy Weld with four wheels. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I understand they weighed 2,200 pounds, which I presume that's where the the name sort of came from is they were as heavy as a tank. That's right. But there again, I presume that Pappy made those cars that way for the idea, I'm going to say, of local racing, how tough it can be and the grind they go through. And I'm sure he put a little extra into those cars so that they would withstand the abuse, as you always say. <laughs> yeah, he did. And he only built cars for his boys. He didn't, yeah. he didn't build them for anyone else. Yeah. So if he fired one of his boys, and someone else did get a chance to drive one of them. So that was special, I'm sure, to them, too. <laughs> uh, during this time, Ricky's also uh, running at uh, Knoxville trying to qualify for the Nationals. Now, from what I understand, he made a couple of Bs and a couple of Cs, but actually never did get into the A main for the Nationals at Knoxville. That's correct. He never made it. He would either break before... <laughs> He would get in, maybe uh, he'd blow a tire or a motor, <laughs> and it was over. So yeah. he always had that little monkey on his back there, but, yeah. but he loved it anyway, and he always went back. I was going to say, back in the heyday of sprint car racing, it was the place to race. It was the place to race. It's about the fastest half mile in the Midwest. Yeah. So, it uh, was, If you were a sprint car driver, it was a destination that you wanted to be at. That's right. I mean, you raced around here, I think, to kind of race each week or whatever and have the competition around here. But if you really wanted to see what you could do, you went to Knoxville to find out where you really stacked up with, with everybody. In 75, uh, May of 75, Ricky's racing up at the old Shawnee track that's just an uh, outsider on the outskirts of Topeka and beats one of the inductees from last year. Tiger Bob Williams was inducted last year. And uh, Ricky manages to uh, pull off the win up there and beat Tiger Bob. He said it was a hard win because he was out front and he didn't have any competition to go with. You know, he uh -huh. had to stay out there. And he, sometimes it's harder to be out front than it is to be second <laughs> or third. So uh, you're just in the air. And uh -huh. yeah. But he, he said he had a blast. Yeah. I, I'd like to say that. sometimes when you're out front, you're... You don't know what the guys behind you, what line they're running or whatever, whether they're faster than you are or what. So it, it does make it a little bit tougher. Yeah, and Ricky, he was a youngster and Bob wasn't, and he thought it was great he could beat somebody that even raced for Pappy. You know, <laughs> Bob Williams did race for Pappy too. Yeah. So he felt like he really accomplished something when he won that race. Yeah. He told me that he thought that that was one of his prize moments in his career. Was when he raced that race yeah. and won that race, he said he never... He'd never been in a race so long in his life. <laughs> you know, knowing that the guys behind him that were behind him were there, uh -huh. it just seemed like time slowed down. And he was able to be patient and stay in the line and get the job done. That sounds so funny because as I remember, Shawnee was a quarter mile, and I mean a small quarter mile if I remember correct. It wasn't a really big big racetrack so if he thought it was a long race <laughs> he must have been sweating it a little bit then he, he was he used to say he heard all kinds of noises oh that he shouldn't have been hearing uh, because he was out front yeah and, I bet. yeah that scared him a little <laughs> <laughs> also during this time uh he gets on the asphalt at i said now whose car was he in he was in the he was in the ninety four. He was in the ninety four. So it was a weld car. It was a weld car. Yes, it was. Yeah. He had a special setup for that car, is what it, is what he said. Uh -huh. And he had some ideas on how he was going to fix it up to run on asphalt. So, you know, he could do multiple tracks. He was a good person to set up a car at a dirt track uh -huh. or an asphalt track. You know, bank track and non-bank track. Yeah. So he was just great at that. I was going to say, this has to show some of the versatility of Ricky to be able to. And we're talking about the same year now. We're talking about 75. 
and here he is winning at Shawnee and then goes out to I-70 and pulls off a win out there. So it's, like I say, really shows the versatility that Ricky had at not only driving but also at setting the cars up. In 78, uh, Ricky sets the one lap track record on the mile uh, down in Sedalia at the fairgrounds. And this is uh, one of the things that Ricky got to take with him because the track no longer exists and the record stood for a number of years. And Ricky, I'm sure, had to be pretty proud of that. He was proud of it. You see, they started running wings the very next year. So oh, that's right. I'm sorry. I forgot. So it was, it was uh, wingless. So it was the last wing race they ran there. Uh -huh. And he, to this day, it stands. And he was in the number six car for... Uh, he was in the number six car of Jim DeGilder. It was wrenched by Whitey Harmon. And... Uh, he loved that accomplishment. He said, I'll hold that forever because the mile track closed and they started running wings the next year. Uh -huh. So he was so proud of that. Yeah. I, I guess that I hadn't really thought about it, but it was that time in racing when sprint cars were going from the wingless, which it had been for a number of years, right. into the wings. And I, I presume that was a step forward and it was quite a bit safer for the drivers to have that extra protection. Yeah, it was, and actually, uh, Rick, he uh, designed wing hats and sold them to, to, protest, <laughs> to protest the wing, uh -huh. you know, the non-wings, so he made quite a bit of money that, that, that night, just selling <laughs> wing hats, and it was a pretty big deal. Oh, that's neat, I like yeah. that. <laughs> it sounds like maybe he should have lived in Indiana and raced USAC, because they've, they've pretty well held on to the... To the non-wing tradition back there. Yeah, and he did, and he he preferred running non-wings. He said because they get up and go. Yeah. He said they they don't mess around. Okay. So wings are training right. wheels for sprint cars. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> In 1980, at the national sprint car race at I-70, oh, I'm sorry, Riverside, uh, Ricky starts on the uh, pole and leads all 30 laps of that race. Now, once again, uh, Riverside, one of those little small bull rings that we have and have had around Kansas City. But it uh, sounds like Ricky really uh, prized that win, too. He prized that win with everything. Uh, his richer at that time was Steve Staley. And Steve Staley was with him for about 12 years racing. And Steve said that they worked on that car so much they were all greasy and dirty and it was over and they got their picture taken with the flagman and, uh -huh. you know, the checker flag there and, and they were all dirty, but they just loved that win. They were just celebrating, just sort of celebrating everything yeah. for that. I was going to say, I think a, a lot of, pi excuse me, a lot of times we want to give the driver all of the credit and let's face it, it's a team Racing really is a team sport. I, I don't, a lot of people don't want to really admit up to that sometimes, but boy, them guys that turn the wrenches sometimes really help out a lot. And I'm really glad that you give those guys some love, I guess we'll say. Yeah, I do. I give them some love. I still talk to Steve, and he's given me a lot of information. Yeah. Uh, you were telling me that Steve has just really been enjoying this time because he was a crew member of, of Ricky's and is really enjoying this that Ricky's getting to go into the hall. I mean, it kind of represents them, too, in, a, in a, some aspect. It does, and Steve has just been reliving memories from the past, and it's just awesome, he it said. He just laughs on the phone when I talk to him. <laughs> I can just hear it in his voice, you know, how happy he is for Rick. Yeah. I was going to say, it sounds like, like so many of the guys from this era, they had fun. They loved to win and they loved to race, but they had fun. They had lots of fun. Yeah. They didn't always win, but they had fun. <laughs> <laughs> they have their bad nights, too. Okay, in 2006, <clears throat> excuse me, after being out of racing for 20 years, Rick, at the age 51, Rick returns to Knoxville in the Jordan Brothers Sprinter to run the Masters Classic. Now, why was this race so special for Ricky? Jason? Man, uh... His, his dad was being inducted in the Hall of Fame that year. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he felt like his career culminated with, you know, he really felt like 
it meant something to go up there. And, mm -hmm. and more than racing there, more than the success he had there, mm -hmm. the fact that he was going to go up there and run in honor of his father being inducted was just something that he had no words for. Yeah. You know, and, and uh, you can see it when he was here days before. You can see it when he was there on the track, yeah, yeah. in the car. Beaming a little. Just, there, his, picture, his picture there says it all, what he's thinking about before he rolls out. Yeah. He, you know, he's just, uh, he's honored to do it. Yeah, right? I understand he set a special time, too. He had he some, did. some recognition into the time that he set there. His number was the number one for the Jordan brothers and 94 for his father. Uh -huh. And so they ran the 194, and his time in qualifying was 18-194. And so when he heard that on the announcer, uh -huh. the announcer, he said, wow, that's amazing. You know, it just, it got real emotional for him there. And he knew that Pappy was there with him, and like he always mm -hmm. was, uh -huh. in the pits, you know. And uh, it, it was a real special moment for him. Yeah. He uh, you know, it felt like he, he was completed there. Yeah. He was complete there. You know? yeah. And to be able to go back and compete after 20 years, yeah. you know, just, it moved him. I was going to say, to step back into one of those machines and the way technology and everything developed in over 20 years, I mean, it not only had to be special, it had to be, have a little, oh, to get out there and do that. He did. Uh, the horsepower was triple, probably what it was yeah. in the 70s and early 80s. And uh, they had radios, and Rick never ran with a radio. Uh -huh. He said it distracted him, and he told Rodney Jordan, uh -huh. who I want to say a special thanks to for letting Rick drive his car, um, that uh, he had to take the radio out. He was sorry, but yeah. he, couldn't, he couldn't have it in there. But uh, he always thought that moment was just awesome. And uh, <laughs> He was afraid to put the pedal to the floor because of the <laughs> horsepower that they had there. And, and when, he went, when he went in 08, I told him, I said, you put your foot all the way to the floor, uh -huh. you know. So that was something he did the next time. Yeah. I was going to say, in 2008, he goes back again. And Ricky sets the fastest time that he'd ever run at Knoxville, 16-5-21. And he's in Mike Hausman's Y number 5 at age 53. And um, quickest time he ever ran in Knoxville? The quickest time he ever ran. He said he felt like he went back 25 years when he got out of that car. Mm -hmm. and. He never knew he had a fast time until they told him, but uh, he said he felt like he'd go another 50 laps <laughs> around that track. The adrenaline was flowing. The adrenaline was flowing big time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A really, really, there again, another, I'm sure, high point in Ricky's career to know, you know, that he did that, because that's a pretty decent, respectable time. I mean, it's not what Swindell or Kinzer or somebody like that's going to turn, but still, Right. Pretty respectable out there. Right. It was a 360 car. Oh, was it? Okay. And it, he, uh, I recall the uh, the pole was in the 16s as well, I believe. Oh, was it really? Okay. For that night. And I was going to say, some of those guys are not 20 years out of racing to do that. Right. So. It was amazing. It yeah. was absolutely amazing. Uh, Rick felt the whole trip up there that he felt he had to do this. Uh -huh. And he is so glad he did. Oh, I bet. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's so glad he did. Yeah. Well, just three days later, though, Rick goes to the doctor and he finds out he's got cancer. Yes. And the more, you know, he says, I'm so glad I went up there and raced that race. Yeah. He said, because I couldn't have had that. So he felt like God gave him his last fast ride. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that was special to him. Special for Rick. Yeah, and I'm glad he got to do it. Yeah. Um, he never regretted it. Oh, I bet never. not. Man. Never. Of course, getting those old timers together sometimes too, just them around telling stories and bringing back stuff that happened 20 years ago. Uh, they just they just love that. Let alone being able to get out there on the track in a race car and get to do it all over again. Right, and I want to thank Mike Houseman for letting him drive in that car because he had posted on the internet that he needed a ride, and Mike contacted. Him. Oh, really? So, yeah, because he had two cars. So Mike drove one and Rick drove one. Oh, really? Rick, oh, Rick set his car up and Mike set his car up. Yeah. And Rick went faster than Mike did. He wasn't too happy about that. Because <laughs> he said, you haven't been in a race car as much as I have, and you're going faster than this owner that owns this car. Yeah. So that was fun time for Rick. Yeah. 
took his mind off his pain. Kind right. Of. Okay. Because yeah. he he was in pain. At he that was time in pain. Already. Yes, he was. He knew he knew something. Was wrong. He knew something was wrong. Yeah. We just didn't know what. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, Jenny, I'm going to ask you this question. I know there's got to be a story <laughs> about racing, and you, you related one to me on the phone, and I don't know if that's the one you're going to tell, but I like to die. Uh, there's got to be a story either you or Rick told, or you guys did, or you participated in about racing. What is it? Yeah. Well, if we could, I'd like for each of us to tell a story. Okay. Can we do that? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay, well, the story I have is... Uh, our first date was at the Sedalia State Fair in 1975. I got to stay all night with Rick for the first time ever at a racetrack. And it would have had to have been a well to stay all night with. Yeah. Okay? So I knew something was going to happen. Uh-huh. You know. <coughs> so we, we go to the races and afterwards we uh, we go to the Midway to ride the rides. And of course Rick's spinning me around and, <laughs> you know, on the rides, getting me all dizzy. And we come back to the pits afterwards and Rick says, well, where's my car? My car's missing off the, off the, tra- off the trailer. <laughs> and I said, well, I don't know. I said, he, so he's looking around. He says, someone took it, and I'm going to find out. Come on, Jenny, let's go. And I said, okay. So we go, and he finds the people he asks, somebody, yeah. and found out Gene Jennington took his car. Gene Jennington took his car off the trailer and hid it somewhere. <laughs> so Rick looked at me and said, it's on. <laughs> and I said, what's on? I'd never experienced being, yeah. I've been to the races many times in my life, but never experienced something like this. Mm-hmm. So he says, you're going to help me. And I said, I am. He said, yes, you are. We're going to go find Gene's car. So we get Gene's car. We take it out on the mile because they just watered down the track after the oh, races. So it's my. nice and muddy. And Rick goes, we're going to get him good. So, uh, so he puts it out on the mile. We hide behind these bushes, and we wait for Gene to come back down to the pit. So we're waiting there, and here comes Gene. He finds out his car is gone. He says, I know who did it. Ricky <laughs> Well, I know it. Yeah. So he's looking around for us, and and he sees this semi-tractor trailer there in the parking lot down there in the pits, at pit area. And there's some people sleeping in the sleeping bags. Uh. So Gene Jensen says, there they are over there. Let's go get them, you know. So he runs over there, really you know, like a little army man, yeah. you know, creeping, and uh, he jumps him. And it wasn't us. Rick and I were behind a bush watching the whole thing. <laughs> and things like this, you know, racing's really on the tr- when you're on the track, it's all business. Once uh-huh. you get after the race is over, you oh, can yeah. play tricks on each other and yeah. and get each other, you know. And this was just one of those times, and that was a story I remember. Yeah. Oh, that's deep. Yeah. I love that. That that is so funny. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Oh, Jason, what do you got to tell us, buddy? Well, I wasn't there for a lot of his racing career, so I'm gonna I'm gonna hit up the point of the father he was Mm -hmm. after his racing career. Okay. You know, he uh, when I was 18 years old, he came back into my life, Mm -hmm. and um, in 2004, we. work together. We're trying to start a business cross country, hauling cars cross country, uh-huh. transport. And um, we were with a shyster guy. We didn't know he was a shyster, but you know, we were trying to get started and we needed other people. And mm-hmm. So we hit the road for this guy for 18 days. Mm-hmm. And um, we crossed the country three times and 18 days made up for that 18 years yeah. that he was gone. And it was a special moment for me in my life. I'll never forget it. Yeah. He laughed, we cried, we mm-hmm. did everything. And he, one thing that he did after his racing career, because he knew it was a sacrifice for his family, uh-huh. was he, he was able to make a serious impact on everybody after his career. Uh-huh. You know, not only did people see him, and they, they cheered for him, and they, they thought he was a great driver, he was a great person. Yeah. Outside of racing, and anybody that you meet will tell you how yeah. much he helped them. Uh-huh. How many people stopped here to set up his car? Uh-huh. Off. <laughs> yeah. Just, you know, and he, he was just a really good hearted, good spirited person. And, uh, people loved him. Yeah. You know, I think that's a lot of times what we forget about race car drivers is that they are people just like you and me. Yep, that's right. And we forget about that. He loved children too. Did he? He loved kids, and and uh, there was a little 
little boy that used to come to the um, uh, racetrack to get his autograph, and he had a little patch on his eye, and Rick would pay special attention to him because he had a disability. Uh -huh. The other kids kind of teased him a little bit, so Rick used to pick him up and put him in his race car and let him sit in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the other little boys, you know, didn't get to sit in the race car, so he said, until you treat this little boy right, he said, then you can sit in the race yeah. car. Nobody else. Nobody else. <laughs> so that was really a, a neat little thing. That yeah. Rick, he loved children. Yeah. And he always signed their autographs. Yeah. Well, guys, I want to thank you a lot, and I know that your families, and I include the total Weld family into that, are really proud of Rick and his life in racing and his induction into the hall. Yep, the, the induction is just almost overwhelming. Uh, it's wonderful feeling to know that his life will be looked at now in a light that's important to people in a hall of fame. So I feel very honored to have him there, and uh, I thank Carb for voting him in. Okay, folks, that's going to do it <laughs> for the inductee, Ricky Wells, going into the Carb Hall of Fame for the class of 2012. Thanks again, guys. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you, Mike. Thank you. It's nice to meet you. Without the wind, there would be no sails. And if not for you, there would be no hero in me. There are times I have shined, and there are times that I've failed. Sometimes a hero he'll ride off. But he'll be back again another day Sometimes a hero Seems awfully far from home But even a hero Can't always stop the cold wind When it blows But if you hold tight The long night will soon be tomorrow and you'll find me when you need Sometimes a hero Sometimes a hero Seems awfully far from home But even a hero Can't always stop the cold wind When it blows But if you hold tight The long night will soon be tomorrow